The world's last remaining only World War I airfield needs your help. And today on the show, we're going to find out how you can do just that. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. And we've got a good one for you today, because when I started the Damcasters, one of the first people I spoke to was a chap called Ian Flint, and he is the CEO of Stowe Maris, which is the world's last remaining World War I only airfield in existence. And because I am terrible, I've only just got back to him because of one major reason. And that is because of some roadworks, they've had a massive funding gap because people haven't been able to get out to the airfield. So today on the Damcasters, we're going to specifically be talking all things Stomaris and see how we can all help to plug that funding gap that they have, whether that's by visiting or donating through their crowdfunders. So as always, we have to thank our incredible sponsors at another aircraft museum, the Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued support of the podcast. But today we're gonna to be heading out to Essex and to chat to Ian about Stowe Murray's, what's coming up over the summer, how you can help. But as always, when we start our interviews, we gotta find out how our interviewee ended up where they are. Ian. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to talk about a lot, but I just want to ask about you. How did you end up at such a fabulous place as Stowe Murray's and the role that you've got now? Because it's it's a unique place and it seems like it needs a unique sort of person to be able to keep it going. <laughs> it's a really lovely thing to say. Oh, I'm quite touched <laughs> by that. Um, yeah, I suppose I am unique. My guys and girls that work with me would tell me that I am unique, I suppose. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> I come from a museum background, and my background, I've always been very lucky that I've kind of kept a foot in both camps. Traditionally, in the heritage community, you're either part of the visitor engagement, so you may be part of the learning team, or you might be part of the enterprises operation side, which is kind of the retail or the... Uh, the, uh, the catering side, hospitality. You might be part of the administration side behind the scenes working in that sort of stuff. Or you might be part of the conservation and curatorial side. You know, if you're dealing with fine art or objects, you might be looking at the care of the mm. collections. Well, my career through the heritage community has encompassed all of those. I've kind of kept a foot in each camp. And in keeping with some organisations, no matter how big and established they are, you tend to find yourself doing something on a Sunday that you didn't realize you were doing until Sunday. And then you learned how to do it on Sunday and you showed how someone else had to do it on Monday. And then you're doing something completely different on Wednesday, you know? So I'm one of those really strange guys who can thankfully and luckily uh, I've had the opportunity to learn how to tell you what you're allowed to do with that two star listed building, what plug sockets are right for the period you're trying to do. Oh, and you want to know how we're going to hang this 17th century painting. Yeah, I can advise you on that. Or I know someone who can tell you how to conserve it. Oh, and while we're at it, if you want to know about how we're going to foster good ecological stuff, we can work on entry level law stewardship schemes for natural England. Yeah, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> so that's how I kind of that's how I came to be the person I am. I, I think it's more by luck than judgment. And chronologically speaking, I was working at a uh, pretty lovely place in London for English Heritage Trust in 2016. And uh, a mutual friend of mine got in touch from another really nice place further up north um, to do with code breaking, let's put it that way. And uh, they said, look, mm -hmm. you know, Stomari's is interested in finding someone to take it to its next step. Um, and as it's sheer, just sheer chance, I'd assisted someone in 2008 writing an interpretation plan for just hypothetically, if there was a World War I aerodrome that needed to be the story told, how would you do that? And I'd written a piece for it, and I'd not thought any more about it. But, you know, one thing led to another. Before I know it, I'm sitting in a, a hangar talking to a couple of board members next to a World War One reproduction aircraft, and they're saying, do you fancy coming and playing? And that's how I kind of got there, really. That's brilliant. And it, it it's sort of oddly serendipitous, isn't it? Sort of Hugely. drawing you out to deepest, darkest Essex. We're going to come back to the deepest, darkest bit in, <laughs> in, a, in a minute. But let's... for. The listeners who have not heard about Stomari's, what is it? 
because its story in and of itself is an amazing one of survival, isn't it? Yeah, there's no doubt about that. It's a true, true uh, sleeping beauty. That's what it is. So historically speaking, it was vital and it's vital as a conservation statement now. But I suppose the strap line uh, that we need to think about to embody it in one place, it, it is the last remaining functioning Great War aerodrome that's been untouched since its operational times. And what do I mean by that? Because that's a lovely marketeer's poster child sort of thing to say, isn't it? Um, what I mean by that <laughs> is that the doors opened. It did the job it was meant to do in Great War. The doors closed. And that's where it ended until a charity stepped in to try and get it back on its feet. Uh, it had no interaction with uh, World War Two as an operational station, unlike all of its compatriots. It was explored for various uses in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. But the reality is that it was farmland. It was converted in an aerodrome built there. It was closed as an aerodrome. It was used by a farmer. And then it was reopened for the purpose we have now, which is a museum and heritage site. Um, historically speaking, it's fascinating. The uh, Royal Navy in the Great War were... Uh, given the job of protecting the ports and the home cities. And very quickly it became clear the Royal Navy just didn't have the resources to do so. So they said, look, we can't do this. Uh, we need to give it back to the army, the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, the Royal Flying Corps, being an army unit made up largely of uh, cavalry, ex-cavalry people that are transferred in, and being the only mechanised unit I might add, World War One, they were completely mechanised, unlike the rest of the British Army, not, not a horse in sight. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, fine. And like the British Army does, if you're going to defend something, you have a perimeter. So the perimeter was what we would now think of as somewhere between, I suppose, the M25, that sort of route. They drew a line around London. And then they drew a line a bit further out. And they acknowledged that the people that were coming in to attack London and everywhere else in the southeast were going to use rivers to navigate by, just like they do now, to a certain extent. And they decided they would establish bases to operate protection activities of those rivers. So Stomaris was part of a trio, uh, Stomaris, Goldhanger and Rochford. Rochford is now Southend International. Goldhanger is now Farmers Fields and Stomaris is Stomaris. And we were the base for 37 Squadron protecting London by patrolling the Crouch River, the Blackwater and the uh, entranceways to the Thames. That's what we were there to do. We were tasked with fighting Zeppelins and later fixed wing bombers. Bombers. How's that? That's amazing. So whereas we, a lot of the airfields that we sort of, know and love from air show days and things like that, your, your Duxfords, your, your, your Biggins, generally that have that First World War link have been constantly developed all the way through to the 60s, 70s and today, whereas Stomaris was just returned back to the state it was beforehand. So yeah, you know, you've got yeah, that I mean, sort of mi mi microcosm of history right there. Then. Absolutely, absolutely. So, <laughs> I mean, it started in, in sort of October 16, uh, 1916, uh, where... They decided that's what's going to happen, so they compulsorily purchased the land from the Turner family. Some of the listeners to this podcast may be aware of there was a, uh, a very famous kind of pseudo-romantic series of novels called the Flambirds Trilogy uh, that was written in the late 60s by a lady called Peyton. Uh, and that featured a, a lady who was a, kind of technically evacuated to live on a very nice stately house near a farm, and an aerodrome was built next door to it. Well, just by sheer coincidence, uh, Miss Peyton lived just around the corner from Stomaris and the farm that the land was bought from is called Flambirds. So make of that what you will, if it's any influence <laughs> on the Flambards novels. Um, but if you Google it, there was a TV series and everything. Anyway, so the army went in and said, yep, yeah, we can do an aerodrome here, Mr. Turner, so we're going to buy it off you. That meant the Royal Engineers and the Canadian Timber Corps went in along with B Flight of 37 Home Defence Squadron, four BE-2Es, which are essentially lovely, stately Land Rovers of the sky. <laughs> Excellent as a photo <laughs> reconnaissance aircraft, uh, as a fighter interceptor, uh, a complete dog's dinner, but still lovely. And it was lots of white canvas tents and a white canvas hangar. And then over a period of years, wooden huts appeared, slowly to be surely replaced with brick buildings. At the end of hostilities, uh, or towards the end of hostilities, obviously fighter operations were centralised. By this time, it's not RFC Stomaris, it's RAF Stomaris. Um, and we were the only aerodrome that was operating BE2Es on Formation Day in 1918. And we were also flying them 2018 on Centenary Day. We are the only place in the world that was doing that. Anyway, at the close of hostilities, they decided to centralise fighter operations. 
and they decided that fighter interceptors should be based at Biggin Hill. And uh, they sent a load of our guys and girls down there, downloaded their brain to help formulize the, the work at Biggin Hill. Biggin Hill was already established, don't get me wrong, but it was very much the home defense lessons were there to influence the setting up of the centralized operation. They slapped a padlock on the gates of Stone Maris in May 1919 and said, that's that. The Turner farmer, Mr. Turner, he then went round, chopped down as much oak as he could find on his land because it was at a premium due to the loss of shipping, etc., and managed a couple of years later to buy it back at auction for about twice the price he was paid for it. But he got all the built estate with it. Um, that included right, around okay. yeah. 38 Armstrong huts. Um, if one looks out into the village huts, these were the rural community councils that were given lots of World War I huts to turn into village halls. So if you look at the wooden huts that make up village halls, they're usually ex-World War I huts. We had about 38 of those on site, as well as loads of brick buildings. And he was very happy because he suddenly had accommodation for his farm workers and his building that he could put grain in and he could put vehicles in as time went on. He's, he, he farmed it and then his son farmed it. And in 2004, his son decided he didn't want to farm it anymore. And in 2008, it was put up for sale. Uh, a private concern bought it to turn it into an industrial estate. Uh, the locals didn't like that. A conservator was slapped on it. And then he decided, well, hang on, if I can't turn it into an industrial estate, what can I do? The decision was taken out of his hands because his wife won the lottery. And so they decided, why am I even worrying about this? Got on a plane to the British Virgin Islands and never came back. Um, but a tenant at the time, <laughs> a tenant at the time had a couple of the buildings that he'd overseen the renovation of. So he could put a performance energy management workshop in a performance energy engine management workshop. What a mouthful. And he was working on kind of uh, V4 engines and stuff for race cars and, and that sort of stuff. He tried to raise the money to buy it himself, but that didn't happen. But he did manage to get in front of some people who put a charity together and they petitioned and got a very generous grant from the Heritage Memorial Fund and a loan from Essex County Council and a loan from Molden District Council. They managed to buy it. 1.8 million. Thank you very much. They had about 500 quid left and they sat there wondering what on earth are we doing now? <laughs> they had got 23 <laughs> two-star listed buildings on the at-risk register. And that was about it, really. And then, thankfully, around this time, that was in the dying days of 13, early days of 14, that happened. At which point, Mr. Osborne in Downing Street was trying to work out how he was going to spend the money from the LIBOR fund. Do you remember this? The, the fund that was set up with the fines mm -hmm. for the banks fixing the interest rates? So it was decided that yes. what a great way to fund the commemorations of the Great War. And so the story goes, and I don't know if this is apocryphal, it sounds lovely, but I don't know if it's true. So the story goes, he was sat in his office and he said, well, I know what I'm going to do with, for the air camp, uh, uh, with the land campaign. We've got the SOM. We can spend loads of money on things for the SOM because we've got loads of things happening on the ground. Great. I know what I can do for the sea campaign, the naval campaign. I can do stuff in Scotland about Jutland, which is obviously not in Scotland, but that's the closest navigable point. I can do stuff like that. What on earth do I do about the air campaign? And then he had a chat with Sir John Whittingdale and Pretty Patel, who just happened to be the MPs that bracket Stomaris in Essex, who said, oh, have you heard about Stomaris? At which point we were given a very nice grant and we've been living on that ever since. And we've been slowly but surely renovating the buildings. We've won awards for our exhibitions. We put on events. We've slowly but surely grown. We are an accredited museum now. Uh, we're a functioning aerodrome. We're only allowed single-engine fixed wings, so it's not as if we're allowed rotary helicopters or we're not allowed twin-engined or jets or anything like that. We're only allowed the aircraft that we flew from of a type, so single-engine fixed wing. So we can have modern single-engine fixed wing, but you know, biplanes and single-engine light aircraft is what we're about. We're a renovation project, so those two-star at-risk listed buildings don't like staying up. They're trying to fall down, so we have to fix them. We've renovated and returned about nine of them to use now. We've got award-winning exhibitions in a lot of our buildings. We've got a really great cafe and restaurant in our Airman's Mess. So you sit and have a cup of tea and a sandwich where they did. And we've got all sorts mm -hmm. of other bits and bobs happening as well. Two hangers you, for you were, you were telling me about that when we spoke on the phone. You've got a very tasty sounding quiche as well, by the looks of it. I'm, just, I'm, I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> the so quiche that's is marvellous. I'll tell Rosie. <laughs> She'll be very proud of that. The quiche is famous. Then it's famous <laughs> for the bread pudding. <laughs> so it's, it's a really thriving, busy well, yeah, it's a really thriving, busy place. A volunteer, so we're Queen's Award-winning volunteering centre. So the volunteers, we've got over 100 volunteers, 150 volunteers, and they their activities are what's really making a difference here. So they're working on repairing everything, and it's a real challenge to isolation and loneliness. It's a challenge to uh, to all the, the things that affect well-being in a negative way. 
We've got uh, men mm -hmm. and women who have been volunteering with us. The youngest is 16, the oldest is 96, and he refuses to be told not to go up a ladder. So there's a huge array of people. <laughs> They're award-winning in their own right. And I come from a museum background. I know how good exhibitions are and how good they need to be. And just the, the, if you went to see the, any of the exhibitions, you would not believe they were done by people that hadn't been doing it professionally for decades. They are really, they are that good. This all sounds fantastic. You know, quiche aside, which of course we 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 need to highlight because a good quiche is a, a rare and wonderful thing. But I've I've well, dear listener or viewer, if you're watching this, I've not been. So can I come down in and we can do like a, a whole sort of tour and a video of, of, of all the exhibitions? Well, of these. we'll talk about what you have on and what you've got coming up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, well, we open Friday, Saturday and Sundays, but there's no problem. I will come down anytime you want. Just let me know when you want to come down. I'll show you around. We've got hangars full of aircraft that are lovely and I'll introduce some of the guys and girls and we'll show you some of the exhibitions and I'll even let you have some of the quiche if you want. Absolutely lovely. Wonderful. We've got events coming up that you might you, want to come you to. Had, you, you had me at quiche, but the rest of it sounds fantastic <laughs> as, as, as well. So let once we finish recording, let's get something in the diary for that. But... I'm going to sort of circle back around to what you've got coming on um, over the summer because there's, 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 you've got fun stuff. You've got the Living History Weekend this weekend as well. But there's a specific reason why we're chatting, um, yeah. which is why I got back in touch with you as well. Because, again, dear listener, my tardy – I spoke to Ian about two years ago <laughs> having this conversation, and I've just got back to him. So, Ian, I'm sorry about that. But something which on the face of it seems very silly – happened outside your gates and it's led to a bit of a funding crisis hasn't it yeah yeah it, it, it sounds so it, you're right you know it's something so silly that on paper how could it possibly how could that make such a huge difference yeah we have we're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> there's no other word for it like most aerodromes you know they didn't <laughs> they didn't build them thinking that we need to make them easily accessible for visitors they, they built them to be in world war one it was build them somewhere that's windy um so <laughs> we have our main access road is a road called Hackman's Lane, um, and it's between the village of Perlicott Clarks and the village of Stomaris. Okay, lovely, fine. It's quite a fast, straight road, and it's all lovely, and yeah, there we go. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out what could possibly go wrong is the Essex and Suffolk Water Company deciding, quite understandably, they need to do some serious works to move a water main, and in a nutshell without telling us, closing the road completely and then wondering why we kind of went a bit mad because what was meant to be a 10-day work program turned into anything up to 100 days because the 10-day was a typo and what was meant to be letting everyone through turned into turning everyone away and what was meant to be one end only closing turned into both ends, then the other end and before you know it, I've lost nearly all of the visitors, the regular people coming to that wonderful cafe just to enjoy the cafe, which was a regular thing at weekends, for instance. They've all gone. I've had to cancel major events. And I've I, roughly, I suppose, off the top of my head, just for the period of works, what, £30,000 lost income at a blink. And that's, that's not including other stuff without things like the amount of time it's taken me to try and get the roadworks removed. So that's mm -hmm. constant phone calls and constant letter writing where I'm not doing the rest of my job, you know, so lost funding applications, all that sort of It's cost us a fortune. We've managed to successfully, I'm going to be very careful. I have to be careful how I say this. I would love to say we have managed to successfully campaign to get the roadworks removed. I need to say legally, the roadworks have been removed as a decision of Essex and Suffolk Water because they said it was no longer financially viable for them to do the roadworks. So I wouldn't want to claim something which is not true. Uh, but they did shorten their works from 100 days to about eight weeks. Um, and they were removed a couple of weeks ago. Which is so, nice of them. Yeah, mm. it's very, very nice of them. In fact, I had a meeting with them today about what else they can do that might be nice to fill the terrifying hole in our budgets. Because at the moment, we're on a knife edge. There's no other word for it. We are on a knife edge. We're trying to recover those audiences that we've lost. We're trying to get those people back that wanted to come. We don't live in a county that is hugely famous for having a dedicated heritage audience, you know. Um, so we get lots and lots of new visitors, but they, you know, uh, many people travel to see us. But as you can imagine, all those people that made the effort to come and see us to get turned away, they're not going to come back anytime soon. And we have to do huge amounts of communication. I wouldn't mind so much, but the National Lottery Heritage Fund last year recognised how important we are 
and gave us a load of cash and said, you need to tell the universe about who you are and where you are. So we've spent eight times more on promotion for this year than we have done re usually because we haven't got the money normally. So we did all that promotion, loads of things like electric billboards, leaflets, posters, advertising in magazines, advertising in, in brochures and all that sort of stuff. And all these people that turned up got turned away. <laughs> so, yeah, we're in a real <laughs> difficult spot, to be honest with you, Matt. Let's get to the brass tacks here. If someone wants to visit you at the moment, the road is open. They can get to you. We'll, we'll put directions and all the links to, to you guys in the description for the episode and things. So if you want to head out your way at the moment, the normal routes are open. They're not the diversions that you were showing on, on Absolutely. social Absolutely. There's no diversions. So get the diversions you. that took you off to Narnia are gone. All the roadworks have gone. They've removed them completely. Mm. Um, what we have now is we are less than uh, less than 20 minutes from either way of two two junctions of the A12, which we are less than – from that, we're less than 45 minutes from the M25, uh, the A12 junction of the M25. And it really is, from the A12, you're looking at 20 minutes and you're in our front gate. Um, you can get to us. The directions are on the website. It's really clear to do. You just have to go plan your visit, and it's there. Um, as is always with us places in the middle of nowhere, you never use your sat-nav, never use your postcode or anything like that because you'll just end up in the middle of Ulu. Follow the directions. <laughs> and on a Friday, Saturday, <laughs> and Sunday, you don't need to book in advance. A Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you can rock up, and there's a really nice car park there. There's a really nice load of exhibitions. There's a really nice uh, cafe. There's a really nice shop. And that's before we even talk about events. I mean, as you, as you said earlier, we've got the Living History Show this weekend, which is two days. Some of the best living historians we have. They're brilliant. Uh, everything from uh, a World War One padre who is absolutely brilliant, uh, Neil Bond. He's fantastic. He's, he gives sermons, but in a way that suddenly he's fire and brimstone because a little known story about World War One was the work that the parish priests did going over the top with the soldiers. It was amazing. We've got uh, the Nimi Company. We've got the 10th Essex who are doing their trench experience as part of your admission, which is great. We've got uh, various RFC uh, units that are going to be there. It's it's just going to be a great, great living history show. It really is. Um, on top of that, we've got uh, for, for, for the more doggy friendly people, because I'll be honest with you right now, if it's going to get us some money to survive, we're doing it. So we've got the Wings and Wags dog show, which we've got loads of, there's about 30 odd stalls for that, let alone all the people bringing dogs for the classes and competitions, which is going to be hilarious. 18th of August, we've got Prop Wash, which is an air show, and that's going to be amazing. And the support in the aviation community that's come out of the woodwork, absolutely incredible. And again, National Lottery Heritage Fund helping us out as well. So, you know, I mean, let's start with the silly stuff. We've got the uh, Tiger 9 coming, which is nine Tiger Moths doing displays at the same time. That mm -hmm. has to be seen to be believed. We've got the Turbulent team, which for some, uh, some of us of a certain age, we remember the wacky races for, the, for, for some of the youngers. Imagine mm -hmm. Super Mario Kart in the sky, and these guys are flying turbs, seven-meter wingspan <laughs> with a VW engine on the front, and they play chicken under goalposts. And I don't mean they're driving around in a bumper car. These are actual aircraft. They're flying in the sky, and people hold up goalposts on the aerodrome air side and these guys play chicken as to who can get underneath it it's terrifying i can't watch it but on top of that we've got things like the rf4 is doing a fantastic display we've got a spitfire coming in to do a display and on top of all that we've got the world war one types we've got the albatross and we've got the b2e doing their tail chases thanks to world war one aviation heritage trust so it's going to be a fantastic event and that's just in the air of that event on the ground we've got flying clubs and gliders and you know all sorts of other bits and bobs of fema the the, the Women's Pilots Association. We've got uh, Data Attitude Brewery will be there, a barbecue. It's going to be, that's just on the 18th, Sunday the 18th. Those tickets are available online, but you can still get them on the door. But so it's yeah, it's just it's there's so much going on. It's mental. And that's before we get into the stuff after August, after the school holidays. You know, it sounds fantastic. And we're like I said, we're going to come up. We'll do the the whole thing thanks to your invitation there, and get people around. So we'll, we'll be able to show what the exhibits are and things like that. But the event, I've just got the website open here on the the other computer. Lot, you know, even in September, you've got. Um, Shots over stove photo shoot with first world work, a large model show, which are, those things are always great fun. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's you've got a packed, a packed awesome coming up, haven't you? We have. I mean, the thing we need to remember about Stomaris is it's a museum, it's a heritage site, but the reason it needs to survive is a given. It's the only one left. There are other aerodromes that function in different ways, but untouched with the original buildings, it's the largest RFC collection of buildings in the world. 
It's got unique buildings. There's at least three, possibly four. We're still waiting on the fourth to be confirmed. Buildings that do not exist anywhere else in the world. Uh, Historic England, who are funding all sorts of repairs on buildings, they're absolutely up to it. They love it. So it needs to be preserved. We know that. We want to preserve it. We've gone hammer and tong to preserve it. The thing is, those grants don't cover paying the bills. They don't cover me paying someone to cook. Mm -hmm. They don't cover the electricity bill. And, you know, our, our exhibitions, it doesn't matter how low wattage the lights are or how LED friendly they are, any of that. It still costs £100 a week to have the lights on in the exhibitions. There's enough of them, you know. So what we need right now, before we started, we needed visitors. But now with the extra kick that we had this year in the teeth from that road closure, we need to recover the money we've lost and still battle forward. We're in this situation now where we need as many people to come. And that's why those events are like they are. We've, you know, we, we've gone all out and our volunteers are saying we've got to make it happen. We've got to make it happen. We're going to do everything we can. The visitors need to know there's something here no matter who they are, what they are, what they're interested in. On a Friday, Saturday or Sunday, get yourself to Stowe, buy a coffee. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. And that's before we get on to the actual funding. I mean, the crowdfunding we put up, it's incredible. And just in a matter of weeks, it's gone over two and a half thousand pounds. You know, it's just fast. It's just brilliant. So we know that people want to help. And all they need to do now is come and visit us. That's what we need. So I'm going to put the links to the, the crowdfunder on there as well. All the website details will, are in the description to this this episode, everyone. So please do have a look. If you are not able to to get out of Deepest Darkest Essex, have a look at that. See what you can do online. And like I said, we'll we'll get out there and show you around if you're not able to. But if you can make a donation as well, we've made one on behalf of the the podcast because this is the sort of place that we we need to keep around, especially as we are coming up to the 110th anniversary of the start of the first world war as well, which it just seems like moments ago that we, it was the centenary. So it's, it, it's times to focus the mind, isn't it? Ian? It does. I mean, I, I can't believe I, I blinked, blinked and it's, it's 2024. I mean, 2018, that day for us began at four thirty in the morning, April the 1st and went through until I think I got off BBC world service at 11 o'clock that night. And it was, it was amazing. It really was amazing. We saw thousands of visitors that year. We had senior figures of the RAF there. We, I mean, BBC hosted over four hours of coverage from our site. You know, it was amazing. Hundreds and hundreds of cadets paraded for the, uh, the chief of the air staff. And I've blinked and suddenly it's six years later. And we've come so far. I mean, it's really lovely when you have people that came in the earlier days or pilots that flew in in the earlier days, and they come up to you and they say, oh my Lord, what have you done with this place? It's amazing. When did that happen? When did that happen? What, what happened there? That building wasn't even, that was that was in pieces when I saw it last. I mean, I, my, our offices are based in <laughs> Building 30. And Building 30, as it is now, was the Senior Warrant Officer's accommodation, um, which will mean something to most people. But for those who don't, if you think about uh, in the movies and TV programs, usually there's a very short, very broad-shouldered man, usually with a little mustache, shouting at people saying, you horrible little man. Um, in America, they have drill instructors, you know, that, that do the same sort of thing. They are warrant officers. And there's an ongoing joke in the services that somebody dies and goes to heaven and sees a guy with a, a long white beard carrying a crook and a long white robe. And someone asks St. Peter, who's that? And they say, oh, that's God. He thinks he's a warrant officer. That gives you an idea of how important these warrant officers were. <laughs> well, the warrant officer's accommodation, we raised the money to renovate it because it was completely derelict and dilapidated there's a video about this on our youtube channel and the guys and girls at stow the volunteers working with professionals for the certification stuff like electrical stuff and heating they rebuilt it so now our officers are there but some of the people that came in the early days that was an overgrown fenced off derelict wreck of a building now it's an office building. And we always say, come in, I'll show you around. <laughs> and it's the cabins that are now turned into offices where people used to sleep. I must admit, I am jealous. Uh, sorry, I, I am greedy. I've got the senior station warrant officer's cabin. So I've got a double cabin for my office. Well, of course. Yeah. yeah. Admittedly, I do share it with the finance officer. <laughs> and I obviously, I do exactly as I'm told by the finance officer. So. <laughs> but yeah, it's the changes. If you look at what it was, I would always say to anyone, anyone who hasn't been in for two years, it's a different place. Because there's going to be exhibitions that weren't there. Um, there's going to be buildings that are looking differently. There's going to be people that weren't there. There's going to be aircraft that weren't there. You know, we've got so many different aspects. And it's, we need to save it, Matt. That's what we need to do. We need to save it. Yes, we do. And let's, let's get that day in the diary so we can get, 
get up there, show people around and get get more people involved. And if you are listening to this and are interested in what is the website, how can people find you before we visit again and we show them all around? It's dead easy. It couldn't be simpler. www.stomaries.org.uk. Stomaries, S-T-O-W-M-A-R-I-E-S, www.stomaries.org.uk. Everything you need is on there. The first thing you see is an aircraft with a button saying, plan your visit. And below that, it's got donate now. If you go there, that front page, the events are there. You can see a link to the events. You can see a link to donations. You can see a link to how to plan to get to us. You can see all the things you need. It's all there, stomaries.org.uk. Or follow us on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Insta. We're on X. We're on YouTube. We're on LinkedIn. <laughs> Anything I can do to get the attention of people, I can't lie. I will put all of that into the, the descriptions and the, the, the comment section below this episode and people can get clicking and get involved. And like I said, once we finish, we'll get a date in the diary and we'll come up for a proper visit. Ian, thank you so much. I am ashamed that it's taken me so long to, to get back in touch with you. I apologize for that. But we're going to do you good this time as opposed to nasty as I, as I did in the I last time we spoke. I believe you. It's a, it's a pleasure you. to be invited. Yeah. A pleasure. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you very much. I cannot thank Ian Flint enough for taking the time and for inviting us out to Stone Marie's in the near future. So we're going to try to get that done in the next short little while over the summer and get that out to you. So if you're not able to visit, if you're not in the UK, we'll be able to show you around. And if you are in the UK or visiting and fancy heading out just south of Chelmsford, there's an amazing place to visit. And I'm really excited for that. Keisha side. Now, within all the descriptions will be the links to all of Stomari's social media. And of course, the crowdfunder as well. Whereas if you can just donate a little bit, we've been able to put a little bit in from the pod. We will be able to help them as best we can. And it's really, really worth doing because as you can see, it's a passionate crew. They've had some really, really interesting exhibitions on as well. The Girl Guide one that I have missed that Ian was telling me afterwards, I'm absolutely gutted I didn't get to go see. So check out the links in the description below. Give them a follow on the social media and share their crowdfunding and their events that they've got coming up wide and far. And like I said, we'll be able to show you around the amazing Stomaris soon so until next time thank you so much for your continued support we're not going to be doing any of the other plugging on this go check out stone marie's and until next time thank you very much do take care of yourself check in on your friends bye bye i just want to say many thanks to our fabulous damn castiers on patreon if you head over to our patreon page you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just three pounds a month plus a bit of that the damn casters is hosted and produced by matt Bow and is a bony abroad podcast production